theyeshiva.net. So first of all, I want to welcome my cousin Dini, whom I see is here, right? I see your name. Okay, now I see you. And I want to welcome all of your classmates who are gathered here this uh, afternoon to learn and grow in loving memory of your dear daughter, your Chevetova Bas Nechamadina and Avraham. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for the opportunity, for the invitation and the privilege of sharing with you some thoughts and ideas and feelings. And uh, welcome. I'm also sorry for the last minute change because something came up that I wasn't aware of. So I had to make a last minute change. But I'm glad that uh, you made it. And those who didn't make it will probably uh, see it later. So welcome to everybody. I'll begin with a story that I think is very appropriate to the memory and the neshama of Yocheved. And it's a story about one of the great Hasidic masters known as Reb Matala Chernobyl, Reb Mardechai of Chernobyl. He was a son of the holy Reb Nochem of Chernobyl, who was a student of the Baal Shem Tev and the Magid. The custom of some tzaddikim was that after Shabbos, Mitzvah Shabbos, you know, when Shabbos leaves, it's a difficult time for the Jewish soul. The Gemara says that on Shabbos we have an extra soul in Hashemah Yaseira, and when Shabbos ends, that neshama leaves, and sensitive people feel it. Mitzvah Shabbos is not an easy time. There's what I call PSS, post-Shabbos syndrome. You'll see that people have this urge, Mitzvah Shabbos, they have to go out, they have to do something. Why can't you just stay home? Because there's a, a void, an angst, that the soul experiences Mitzvah Shabbos. The custom of some tzaddikim was the Mitzvah Shabbos, uh, you know, my, our grandmother, Dini and I, and my grandmother, my mother's mother and her father's mother, her name was Taiba Lipsker, Mrs. Taiba Lipsker, Allah Shalom. And she had a custom, and I think she said that she got it from the Rebbe's mother. But Sai Shabbos, she would put on all the lights in the house. Generally, she didn't want all the lights on in the house because there was electricity. She was, not a, she was not an affluent woman, to say the least. But Mitzvah Shabbos, because it's somewhat of a, is a downer, so she put on the lights in the entire home, and then she put on music, and she would dance. She was a very skilled dancer, my grandmother. Did you know this, Dini? Mitzvah Shabbos, all the lights went on, and she would dance, because there's a certain uh, downer on Mitzvah Shabbos. So some tzaddikim had a custom, they would go out, they would take a horse to their wagoner or their horses. They would get into the wagon and they would go out to the field, to the forest, even though it was already dark. But they would go, it was like a type of meditation, connecting to nature, connecting with the world. And they were one Mitzvah Shabbos, the holy Reb Matul Chernobyl, Reb Mardachav Chernobyl, went out for an, ex- uh, went out for, uh, an experience of dveikas with God's world. And he took a few of his chassidim. And it was a very meditative, spiritual experience. And they went out. He lived in Chernobyl. Chernobyl is a city in the Ukraine. Now it became famous, infamous, because of the explosion there of 1986. 1986. So today Chernobyl has, been, um, has become, uh, there's no people there because of the dangers. But there's a lot of forests around Chernobyl, a lot of wildlife. Anyway. If you know about horses, one of the scariest things for horses is to encounter wolves. When a horse encounters a wolf, it can go crazy. Either it can freeze in its tracks and become paralyzed, or it's overwhelmed and startled from fear, and it's very dangerous. It can get very aggressive and wild and seek to escape. Horses are terrified of wolves. The Matla Chernobyler is on the wagon with some chassidim, and suddenly... The horses encounter a pack of wolves. And you know, the glow of the wolves in the dark, the famous glow of the wolves' eyes, the horse encounters it, and the horses freeze. They're frozen. And everybody's frightened. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen next? The wolves can attack. The horse can go crazy. It's dangerous. Ramatullah Chernobyl gets out of the wagon. 
he stands in front of the horses. And he goes into a deep meditation, meditative trance, what you would call dvekas, for a few minutes, close his eyes, and just thinking or experiencing. And then he opens his shirt and reveals his heart. And the wolves come over, and each wolf in the pack gives, puts its head near a mutterless heart and then moves away, and the other wolf does it. And when they finish, they sniff. They Each one like puts his head near the heart and like touches it and sniffs it. And when they're done, they both, they all lift up their forelegs, like standing like a person, in complete awe and reverence, and then they walk away. They're gone, and the horses are fine, and the journey continues. So naturally, what do the Hasidim say? A miracle! A miracle! Wow, that was a Mephis! So Matla Chernobyl says, no, 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 no. It wasn't a miracle. What, what were you doing there? So I'll explain to you, it wasn't a miracle. Animals, by nature, are very sensitive. And they feel a lot of things. They detect energy that we sometimes have a hard time detecting in their own unique animal way. The Zohar says, and Chazal say, that when animals recognize the image of Hashem in a person, the Tzalem Elikim in a person, not only will they not harm them, they will show respect to them. Because they sense that this person is the crown of creation. And the whole world was created for the person to serve Hashem. So whenever an animal recognizes the Tzalem Elikim, the divine visage in the human face, The animal is subservient and reverent. But what does it mean that they see the image of God in a person? What do they see? Rebatullah said, they look if there's no hate in the person's heart. If the person's heart is cleansed from all hate, there's not an iota of hate to any creature in the world. There's no grudges and no resentment and no animosity, and no toxicity, and no negative energy, and no hatred. The image of God is manifest in this person's heart. Because if a person is in the image of Hashem, toiv Hashem lakoil, v'racham uval kol ma'isav. God loves every creation. He creates it. Creates it every moment. So a person who's a reflection of Hashem, his or her heart was overflown with love. There's no space in the heart for toxicity and hatred and negativity. So when the animal sees the image of God in the person, in other words, senses the love that this person has to everybody and everything, the animal realizes that this is a reflection, the image of Hashem, and there is reverence. So Rebatul Chernobyl said, I had to make sure that my heart was cleansed from all hatred. There was no hatred in my heart. And the wolves came, and they put their heads, their noses near my heart to feel that, to sense that. And when they sensed the love in my heart, they backed off. They were in awe. They lifted up their legs, and then they moved away. And for me, this is a really beautiful story, because it's deeper than a miracle. It's not you know, a miracle the wolves ran away. It's really about personal work. Now, you could say, come on, we all have toxicity, we all have traumas, we all have frustrations, we all have anger, we all have jealousy, we all have hatred. I can't talk about you, but I can talk about me. Of course, we're human beings. But what Reb Matala was saying was that those who are aware of their challenges and they don't let it dictate their lives, they can quarantine it. And they can really live in a space of tremendous love to everybody and everything, so the image of God shines in their heart. And I think that this is a very fair tribute and something to learn from Yocheved, who those who knew her or read her, read her writings and know her from her writings know the tremendous love and affection and warmth and sensitivity that she contained within herself 
sometimes too strong, too powerful, maybe for the world to appreciate. But it's something in each of us in our lives to learn. There was a rabbi, a rav, who once, uh, he made a remark that was derogatory about the Rebbe. And then he realized that he erred, and he, he apologized. And he told the Rebbe that he apologized for what he said, and he hopes that the Rebbe is not carrying a grudge against him. So the Rebbe told him, Gloib mir, ich hab nisch kein Trust me, I don't have the time to carry grudges on people. And what the Rebbe was saying is, where does one have time for grudges? Every grudge takes mental space. It's not easy to have grudges. It's not easy to be angry. It's not easy to be hateful. It occupies space. It takes part of your brain, your soul, your energy. So every moment I make a choice, what am I doing with the energy of this moment? Am I going to use it for grudges and resentment and anger and negativity and toxicity? Even if I have my reasons and my old you know, fears. Or am I going to become a channel for infinity, an ambassador of love, light, hope, healing, authenticity, wisdom, redemption. And it's something we could learn from my dear cousin of blessed memory, Tehenish Masatsura B'Tzor HaChayim. Which brings me to another very important point. The opening of this week's parsha, Parsha Sachere Mois, is Hashem speaks to Moshe, Achere Mois Shnei Bnei Arain B'Karvasim L'Fnei Hashem V'Yamusu. After the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they entered, when they came close to God, and they died. And what does he tell them? What does he tell Moshe? He says, speak to your brother and tell him that he should come into the Kaidish HaKadosh, and he has to come into the Holy of Holies, but once a year, on the 10th of Tishrei, which we call Yom Kippur. And a major part of the parsha deals and is dedicated with these issues of what exactly happens on Yom Kippur when the high priest, Aaron, or his children over the generations go into the Kaidish HaKadosh. The obvious question is why this strange prelude Hashem told us to Moshe after the death of the children of Aaron when they came close to God. And if he would have said it to him a different day, it's the mitzvah of Yom Kippur. Why does the Torah have to emphasize that the mitzvah of Yom Kippur going into the Holy of Holies was set after the death of the children of Aaron? It seems like there's a connection there. That's why there's a ju- the Torah juxtaposes the two issues. And one of the very moving interpretations I once heard, I once heard from somebody, how, did, how and why did the children of Aaron pass away? So Chazal say one of the explanations is nichnesu lifnai v'lifnim. They went into the Holy of Holies. The Yom Kippur, the high priest is supposed to go in there, but other days nobody's supposed to go in there, even the Kain Gadol. It's too much energy, too much electricity, too much holiness. They went in, nichnesu lifnai v'lifnim. They went in to Kaidish HaKadosh. It says right here, achirei moish nebnearim bekarvosam lifnei Hashem. They came very close to God. They went into the Kaidish Vayamusu, and their souls left. What does, this is what happens to Aaron's children. What's the mitzvah after that? Hashem tells Aaron, you have to go into the Holy of Holies. Wow. That's the place where his children died. So Hashem was telling Moshe to tell Aaron that he, hosts, he has to go back into that place. He has to go back into Kaidash HaKadosh, into that place. He can't go back every day. He won't be able to live. He can't go back every minute. He won't be able to live. But Yom Kippur, with the right environment and the right avoid and the right mitzvahs and the right preparations and the right rituals and mitzvahs and services, he has to go back. What does this mean in our life? I think what it means in our life is, and this is, I'm going to say something that's not easy. It's not easy for me. I don't think it's not easy for, I don't think it's easy for many of us. And that is, to become the people we need to become, we have to face those things that shame us most and those things that pain us most. 
we have to go back to those places. It's not easy to go back. For many generations, the system was maybe repression or suppression. Consciously or unconsciously, you suppress, you repress. And that's how you deal with it. And maybe for many generations, that was the right thing to do. I'm not the expert. But in our times, and maybe in all the times, you have to be able to go back. Not go back and stay there, but have the courage to look at it, to face it, not to be afraid of it. Because what we're afraid of controls us. What we're not afraid of, we could control. If there's something in my life, it could be very small, but in my life, it causes me, it caused me a lot of pain. It triggers deep, deep, difficult emotions. It shames me. I don't want to go there. But God says you have to. Because if you don't go there, back there, you will remain a victim of it forever. It will always control you. If you can go back there, if you can look at it, you will find your greatness over there. That will become your Holy of Holies. The Baal Shem Tev said this in a very interesting way. It says in Parshas B'Shalach, right before the splitting of the sea, the Egyptians are chasing the Jews. The Jews are stuck between the Egyptian troops and the sea. Hashem tells, and Moshe tells the Jewish people, stop. Watch the salvation of Hashem. As you see Egypt today, you will never see them again. Very strange expression. Moshe Rabbeinu should have said, don't worry, you will never see Mitzrayim again. You're not going back, don't worry. <laughs> we left for good. Got it. What does he mean? Like you see Egypt today, you'll never see them again. Oh. He just say, don't worry, you won't, we will, we will not be seeing them. We were not going back there. No, he says, just as you see Egypt today, you won't be able to, you won't see them ever again. You could look it up in Parshas B'Shalach, it's a very strange passage. He said, you know why you'll never see Egypt again? Because you see them today. If you're ready to look at Mitzrayim today, you will never have to look at them again. If you're not ready to look at them today, you will have to look at them again and again and again and again. <laughs> and how many volumes of psychology is contained in that one liner of the Malshantav? Kashiri Isen Mes Mitzrayim Ayat. Everybody understands what I'm talking about? Will I get any feedback? Okay, because I'll be talking to men. I would have to now discuss this for two hours and explain it. But I hope with women I don't have to do that. Because you see Mitzrayim today, you don't, will never have to see them again. If you don't look at Mitzrayim today, you're not ready to look at it, it's going to stay there. Not in your conscious, in your unconscious. And it will lurk there in the darkness. And it will come out in all types of dysfunctional and strange ways. It will leak out because you're not ready to embrace it. You're not ready to make space for it. You're too embarrassed by it. And we all have a Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means limitations, confinements, that which paralyzes me, that which creates static in my brain, that which is the trauma that paralyzes my amygdala, my limbic brain, that which still keeps me stuck in repetitive thinking. Everybody has their Mitzrayim. If you don't, great, you can get off the call. <laughs> if you do, you could stay on. <laughs> So I have that in me. Am I ready to look at it? Am I ready to talk about it? Am I ready to create space for it? Can I embrace it? Can I have compassion for it? If you could, then you're done. Then you're done with it because you gave it its space and it doesn't define you. When you can't look at it, when I can't look at it, it forever defines me. It defines me even in a deeper way because it comes out in unconscious ways. Finally, there's another very powerful point in this introduction. This is a very famous mimer from the Rebbe Rashab, Achirei Mois, Tafresh Mem 1889, right? 1889. 
and uh, shared by the Rebbe in his Maimer Achere, Mois Tavshin Chav Bey, 1962, Yer Aleph Nissen, printed in the Kutte Sikhs, volume 3, Achere Mois. The sin of Nadav and Aviyu, who died, was not a regular sin. It wasn't an ugly sin. It was a holy sin. They were spiritually enlightened people. They felt transcendence. They were not regular neshamas. They didn't fully land into this world. They weren't grounded. They felt infinity, and that's where they wanted to go. The Erechayim says in the beginning of Parshas, Achrei Mois, they wanted to kiss God. And in kissing Hashem, the electricity of their neshamas was too intense for their bodies to contain it. So they soared back to heaven. And that's what they wanted. <laughs> they were happy. They weren't upset. For us, it's a tragedy. But for them, death is like unplugging the refrigerator. You unplug the refrigerator, the electricity doesn't die. Electricity doesn't die because you unplug the refrigerator. No. Electricity goes back to the place of electricity. It's just not manifested through the refrigerator or through the laptop or through the iPhone or through the vacuum cleaner or through the AC. The electricity doesn't die. Trauma doesn't die. It's just unplugged. So I can't see it in the refrigerator. I can't see it in the body. So not even a view. Their sin was that they wanted infinity. They didn't want to deal with the physical world. They were very, very sensitive. They were spiritually sensitive. And the world was not a place for them. And this is a sin, so to speak. It's a holy sin, because it's, it's the purpose is to continue as much to, 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 the purpose is to be able to try to integrate. So Chesidah so, 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 so says, Nichnesu means they went into the holy of holies. It says their sin was they weren't wearing clothes. They weren't wearing big day kohona. Why? They weren't interested in clothes. <laughs> they weren't interested in garments and cover-ups. It says they didn't want to get married. They didn't want to have children. Marriage is grounding. Yeah, We all know that. Marriage is about, you know, presence. Marriage is about the details. It says they got drunk. They were intoxicated with spirituality. It's all the same point. They went into Kaidu Shakadosh and they burned incense that they weren't commanded. It's all the same theme. They were too big for our world. Why are we told this story? We're told this story, and this is what I want to share with you at my final point. There are souls among us. And if you're one of those souls, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, try to understand what I'm talking about. That their trauma is not they were abused necessarily, or they grew up in a crazy home, or they grew up with dysfunctional parents, or they were traumatized in school, or they were traumatized by the community, or they were traumatized by their parents, or they went through a birth trauma, or something happened in their childhood. They were molested, or they were verbally or emotionally hurt. That's, that's also that's also often the case, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about souls that for them, existence is trauma. Why is existence trauma? Because they're too good, they're too real, they're too sensitive. I know such souls. It's hard for them to wake up, not because, not because somebody did something to them, but because creation is a trauma. And it's true, it is a trauma. Because that result says, how did creation happen? Through tzimtzum. What's tzimtzum? Tzimtzum is that God withdrew his infinity, creating an empty space, devoid of his revealed presence, where creation is. And anybody who lives post-tzimtzum is experiencing the trauma of the tzimtzum, which is not feeling part of oneness. You were differentiated from oneness. We're fragmented in this world. That's hard. For some of us, it's not hard. <laughs> For others who are deeply sensitive, being differentiated, being fragmented, not being part of oneness is very difficult. That was not of an avil. What's the lesson to us? We have to accommodate these souls. It's not easy. For this, we have to become infinite. They have to become finite, and we have to become infinite. They have to go down, we have to go up. What does it mean to accommodate these souls? It means to appreciate 
that there are neshamas that are very, very deep, and they're not going to be able to tolerate superficiality. They can't tolerate superficial Judaism. They can't tolerate empty ritual. They can't tolerate hypocrisy. They can't deal with lies, cover-ups, toxicity. And these children are going to make us grow up. <laughs> Tsar Gidel Bonin doesn't mean the pain of raising children. That's true too. It also means Tsar Gidel Bonin. The pain of growing up through your children. You have to allow your children to help you grow up. Meaning, when we look at our children, it sometimes challenges us to go into a much deeper place, become much more real, much more authentic. Because when you have a soul that is so spiritually intense, my Yiddishkeit, my relationship with God, has to go to that space. If I can't give these children that level of oneness, of real, real, real authentic oneness, I'm not, I'm not creating a home for these types of souls. And today, more and more, I'm seeing, we're seeing this. And we all have to up it a notch. It's really part of Gaula consciousness, because Gaula consciousness is undoing the tzimtzum. It's, it's transforming darkness into light. It's going back to oneness. And going back to oneness is very, very deep. It's really the ability for me to be able to look at every person, every moment, every experience, every challenge, and myself included, and see it as all part of oneness, part of infinite oneness, to really realize the need for fusion, fusion between the highest and the lowest, between the soul and the body, between ayin and yesh, between heaven and earth, between infinity and finiteness. Telling Aaron to go back to Kaidash HaKadoshim is, don't ignore what Nadav and Aviyu did. And that's why it's called Achare. We know Achare means after. Achare means after the death. Why is that the name of the portion? So I once heard from the Rebbe, Yudal of Nisim Memdalad, Toksha Memdalad. Achare, what happens after? There's the death. That's horrible, beyond what people can comprehend and understand. It's Achare. After. What's after? After is, what am I going to do? How am I going to integrate this? How can I take the energy of Nadav and Aviyu and create a space for it in our world, in our homes, in our communities, in our schools? We have to get rid of a lot of stigmas, to get rid of a lot, a lot of internal stuff that are not resolved. We have to really be able to become ambassadors of infinity, to be able to really see a neshama, create space for it without judgment. I bless all of you and all of us to be able to become such people. After learning from Radav and Aviyu and seeing their struggle, seeing what they went through, and I hope you all understand my implications of what I'm talking about. I think I'm pretty clear, but if not, you'll use your imagination. After seeing all of that, to be able to allow that to challenge, to empower, to help us, so to speak, grow up. And grow up, I mean, in a very profound way of really be able to open ourselves up to, to a new light, to a light of infinity that these souls experience and feel in such a powerful way. And help every person we come in contact with, beginning with our own children and our own students, integrate their deepest infinite light with their daily routines and daily schedules, allowing them to create fusion. Because all most obstacles that people go through is their inability to be able to integrate their deepest light into their daily lives. When we experience challenges, when we experience obstacles, when we experience, experience emotions that are that are too hard to deal with, they contain our deepest light. But we don't have space for them. We don't have a way to integrate them. We don't have a way to make them part of us. So, achare, what's the avoid of achare? Achare After comes a deeper space. Don't run. You don't have to run. You don't have to run away from me. You don't have to run away from the world. You don't have to run away from your spouse. 
You don't have to run away from your children. You don't have to run, run away from reality. You could face everything. We'll be here for you. We'll be here for you to accommodate your energy, to accommodate your sensitivity. And you'll be here for yourself. You'll be here for yourself to be able to make space for all the parts of yourself so that your infinity, your deepest nuclear energy doesn't have to run. It can be integrated and light up the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert Jacobson. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. so Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us of your time. We know that it's counted. <laughs> Thank you for giving us. I want to tell you one thing quickly. I hate giving sherm. I live in France, and I think to your sherm. I'm able to give sherm. <laughs> sorry, I take everything you say, and I just like decipher it and use little bits and pieces. Don't be sorry. That's the purpose of it. The well, purpose. Of, the purpose of it is that you should steal all the material. And give it over better than the teacher. That's the purpose. I don't think I can do better, but I, I try. <laughs> I just taught this morning, I taught this morning a sikha from the Rebbe on this week's parsha. why Rabbi Yossi said that he never called his wife, wife. He always called his wife home, my home, not my wife. The Rebbe says, what's the big deal? What's wrong with calling your wife your wife? Why do you have to call her your home? Like, what's the big deal? He said, I never called her my wife. And he gives a, a very, very powerful explanation. I'm saying it because I think you teach, you'll enjoy it. If you go to theyeshiva.net, it's the first class today. I also want to invite all of you, since this is Laelu Nishmas, my cousin, uh, my cousin's daughter, my first cousin's daughter. So, And she really loved Chesidus. She was a very sensitive, very sensitive and spiritual soul, as you probably all know. So I, I want to invite you. I give three times a week a class on Hasidus that I think, especially for women, and I think many of you will appreciate it, Tuesday, 9.45 in the morning, and Monday and Thursday, 7.30 in the morning, but you can also watch a replay, and it's all on the website, theyeshiva.net. I wish you all a lot of atzlocha and bracha. Anybody wants to ask questions on chat? If anybody wants to ask a question, you can ask a question. It can also be... Uh, Directly to me, if you want to, if you want it to be private. I have, I have one question. You said that um, they said that the way you see the Tzorayim today, you have to go back and face them. Otherwise, you're going to keep on dealing with it. And is that why we go so deeply into it every year on Pesach? Because we have to face the Tzorayim yeah. once a year. Yeah. Yeah, we have whatever to. it is that we're dealing with. Yeah. Now, face Mitzrayim doesn't mean, you know, stay there, get stuck there. On the contrary, <laughs> we face it in order to be able to say goodbye to it. That's the idea. But this is very, very challenging because it's very, it's shame, it's very shameful. It's like, no, I'm too good for this. So by definition, we get stuck by it because the shame keeps us trapped. A lot of Hatzlacha to everybody. Have a wonderful day. We should have Surus Tavis. And everybody should experience revealed goodness for you and your loved ones. And a lot of Bracha Vatzlacha. And to be able to realize we live now in a time where everybody needs a lot of Chizuk and inspiration. Everybody is dealing with something. Trust me. And those who are not dealing with anything are dealing with more stuff. <laughs> if you think there's such people. So today it's very important for everybody to realize that they're not only you're not only living for yourself, but it's also everyone today is a leader. Everybody has to be a shtikla rebbe, whether you like it or not. And even if you see yourself as a small person, it may be true, maybe not true, but every person has a power to be able to be there, not just for ourselves, but for other people. So remember the power that you have to ignite souls and raise hearts and inspire inspire minds sometimes yeah, it's a I gesture so. you're welcome you're welcome have a wonderful day everybody and a wonderful week yeah, thank you for the opportunity this class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net please help us continue the classes make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.